in the group. We are in the group. We are live in the group. Welcome. Welcome to The Sovereign Way. My name is Elizabeth and I am your tour guide for the next hour. So remember, you are playing along with a delicious and unusual immersion in the sovereign way to read the Bible. And we're asking if it is true that we are one body of loving consciousness, sharing our unique expressions in an infinite vibrational substance, if that's true, if we really are children made in the image of God, beloved and innocent, beautiful and extraordinarily powerful and magic, and we're participating in an ever unfolding and expanding story of newness and possibility, right? If all of that is true, and it's also true that the Bible is a divinely inspired revelation of God from start to finish, every version, every translation, every omission, every story shared by verbal transmission before a word was even written, every edit made over hundreds of years and every decision made to include or exclude scripture, and even the curation of the order in which the books are arranged, if indeed all of these things were divinely inspired and such a miraculous and powerful infusion of divine will and, mo and movement really is so, then what new is waiting for us to be discovered about who we really are and where we're going? What's possible? This is a bit of logic. If we truly are one and the Bible really is true, then what does it really say? What does it really say? So a loving welcome to our students in the Oasis who are vibrationally studying this right now. Everybody who's here live with me on the call. You could not have chosen a better time to participate in this delicious upgrade because today is the peak of the Lion's Gate opening, which is an astrological event, which means that our prayers are enhanced as our suns, our sun and the fixed star Sirius are aligned in Leo. So this is the opening of a vibrationally powerful time for newness. So welcome to those of you who are in the group with us today. And also, welcome to those who are scrolling by. If you're on the live stream and Facebook group, or if you're on YouTube, drop a comment right now and say hello. Go on, lean in, drop a comment. Say, hello, I'm here. And if you wanna play with us, if you wanna come into the Oasis and play with us in our, in our beautiful experience of, of true studentship of life, let us know and we'll reach out and we'll get you, we'll bring you in. It's not too late to join. So let's start. Are you sitting comfortably? Are you? Let me see. Yes, good, yes, thumbs up, good. Yes, you are sitting comfortably. Okay, we have a student saying you can't get in and I'm going to pass that to Matt because I don't see, I don't see someone trying to get in here. So you're gonna to have to send the invite link. Excellent, thank you. Good, but for those of you who are here already, you are sitting comfortably, you're on your bottoms, you're present in the room, you brought all your electricity in your brain out of the basal ganglia, which is your pattern thinking, and into the free prefrontal cortex, which means you are present with me here now, and you are ready to receive the transmission that's contained in the soaking of the words. And that's a great place to begin the teaching. So the Sovereign Way, we covered this last week, but let's do it again. The Sovereign Way is a structure of thought. It's an ontological arrangement of life teachings and mastery, and it helps us to interpret our moments, 
It helps us to bring meaning and intimacy and power and grace to the experience that we're living, nanosecond by nanosecond. It helps us to reveal the links between consciousness, energy, and form. It helps us to unravel the impossible tangles, to refresh and revitalize what's stagnant and build your spiritual muscle for the human quest. That's what the sovereign way does. That's what it's for. It's a lens that does these things for us when we arrange our thought and our interpretation in this particular way. And there are eight masteries to learn in the sovereign way. If you want, you can download the outline of what these masteries are. If you're in the Oasis, you already have this in a document and in a teaching. And if you are not in the Oasis, but you still want to know what the masteries are, reach out to us and we'll make sure you get hold of them. And you can learn what the outcomes or the results are of having these masteries embodied. Embodied just means that the skill is in your bones. It's in your cellular consciousness. It's in your muscle memory. It's in every, every bit of sinew. It's in every part of who you are and how you know yourself. It's not archived away in the dark libraries of spiritual intellect. It's become such a fundamental part of how you know yourself that it doesn't even need to be a choice anymore. It just is. So what we're wanting through the sovereign way is to have these masteries embodied in our very lived experience so that as spiritual creators in a constant ongoing life, we are simply by default creating grace. And so the lifelong masteries that we teach in the sovereign way, they, they uphold a mysterious position in mindset where you're both living inside constant ongoing deliverance and being liberated moment by moment from the ties that bind and the structures that form to define you and control you. And as well as being in a state of constant deliverance from those structures and systems, you are also participating consciously on your enlightenment. You are participating as a conscious child of God in your own spiritual development and growth. So, so saying I have been saved and I have been delivered is not enough. That's the beginning. That's the journey to the kingdom. But now the journey within the kingdom needs to begin. And you're playing that exquisite story with all the depths of the life experience that follows. As a sovereign one, you can be delivered and be a co-creating, experiencing, delicious, flawed human being. That is essentially what ascension in Christ is. So the sovereign way is saying that you are consciously participating in your ascension and for the love of all things good, do that in Christ. Do it in a field of mercy. Do it inside the delicious grace that's ever present and effervescent for you. That's at the core of what we stand for in the sovereign way. So today's teaching in the sovereign way, we're taking the sovereign lens and we're popping it on the Bible. And today's teaching is an immersion in the first mastery, which is remembering. Remembering. This is a lifelong skill that brings us back to poise in the most turbulent and difficult times, recalibrating our compass and reminding us of who we really are. Remembering is a skill that turns on the light and illuminates the darkness, illuminates the darkness that you're sitting in and it illuminates the darkness that someone else may be sitting in by the nature of your light. So this is the perfect mastery to practice if you're someone who sink, sometimes sinks below the surface from time to time. Do you sometimes sink below the surface? No? Everyone here is in perfect, constant remembering? Oh no, we have some, some admissions here. There are some flawed people on this call after all. Phew! <laughs> it's not just me then. So sometimes we sink below the surface and we forget how truly magnificent we really are. And sometimes we struggle to get back up again. That's the part that's avoidable. Struggling to get back into the light, that is avoidable. 
Forgetting, probably not avoidable, but staying in forgetting, avoidable. We've got really rich and complex stories of the human experience throughout the Old Testament. Remember last week, I told you about the difference between the Old Testament and the New Testament. And the Old Testament is absolutely chock-a-block full of the delicious and agonizing stories of how complex it is being a, a human being. We can see in the Old Testament that across the ages, we've been vulnerable to life. And that despite our best intentions to move on, to move into the Holy Land, to move into the kingdom of God, to move into the true spiritual liberation of being free to love, when we're dancing with energy fields of lust, greed, hate, anger, gluttony, pride, sloth, we create our experience accordingly. So even though we're saying to ourselves, we're ready, we're spiritual masters, we're going to move out of this misery and into the new kingdom, as long as we're dancing with these frequencies of entropy, we keep recreating the old, we keep recreating our experience according to those. And so, in other words, we see time and time again, in the Old Testament, and in our life, that if left unchecked, energy Energy begets energy, generation to generation. That's karma. That is the law of attraction. That's karma. Energy begets energy. And so we forget our true nature and we instead identify with culture, law, systems, expectations, and projections. And since we're so vulnerable to forget, we need to be able to remember. So our awakening is not just a one-time spiritual event in our soul progression, but it is an ongoing mastery that we get to practice as we mature. So when we're lost in analysis and judgment about what Stacey Benson probably meant when she said that thing in third grade, or how much money I think I need to make in order to live the lifestyle I think I need to live, or outlining the steps and happenings that need to occur before my manifestation will be realized. When I'm stuck in those systems, I can go, wait a minute. I remember I am a trinity of source, spirit, and substance. And I have the spiritual authority to live a graceful life of magical possibility. And I remember that this is true for me. And if it's true for me, then it's also true for you. So if remembering who we really are is a basic spiritual mastery, the first, right, the fundamental foundational mastery upon which all your other ascension and spiritual growth is based, then let's examine who we really are. And let's enhance that knowing in our energy field. Let's enhance that knowing in our state of consciousness. So we're better to find out who we really are than in Genesis. Let's go back to the beginning. <laughs> Genesis means the beginning. So let's start at square one and let's see what it says here. In the beginning, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a formless void and darkness covered the deep while a wind of God swept across the waters. And then God said, let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light. 
he prehended the light and said and knew that the light was good. And God separated the light from the darkness. And God called the light day and the darkness he called night. And there was evening and there was morning on the first day. That's what happened in the beginning. So let's put on our sovereign lens. Let's put on our sovereign lens where we say that consciousness precedes energy which precedes manifestation. And let's see what we discover in what it says in Genesis 1. First of all, what we discover is that the formless void of darkness that is quantum potentiality, right, which is, which is the aspect that is yet unformed, which is infinite potentiality that is not yet formed. So the formless void of darkness that is your quantum potentiality is not without spirit. Darkness is not without spirit. It says in Genesis 1-2, spirit moved across the face of the waters. So even though your potential is formless, yet undefined, it is spirit. Your essence belongs to God long before you've declared yourself as one thing or another. Long before you've chosen what kind of a person you're going to be and what kind of legacy you're going to leave, long before that, you belong to God. Because the spirit moved across the face of that unformed void. And look, then God said, let there be light. He allowed light to be. And there was light. It's when light is activated that formation happens. That's when we get particularized reality when we activate light. And look how quickly his choice took effect. There was light. And God saw the light. So that means consciousness declared creation and then saw creation, experienced it, knew it, made agreement with it. God saw that it was good. He said, let there be light. Then he prehended the light and he knew that it was good. And this is when he separated light from darkness and duality was formed. This is the first instance of duality. Now we have particularized reality. Now we have something that is distinct from something that is not. And with duality came process. This is the first time we have process now evening and morning on the first day. So we can tell from just the first chapter in Genesis, that's not even the first chapter, that's, that's the first five verses of the first chapter, it gets even better. But we know based on these first five verses that fundamental to our essential nature is light and dark in process from unformed void to shape and distinction via consciousness, from unformed void until we make the creative declaration into shape and distinction where we engage with it and know it as our experience. What a miracle. How cool is that? I, I expect to see lots of people bouncing up and down in excitement. Look at these ecstatic people. <laughs> I love you all so much. I love you all so much. What a miracle that is, right? So let's play with light for a moment. Let's look at the wave function of light. And let's look at what happens between photon particles. 
we know that in the 1920s, we took a collective quantum leap in our spiritual awareness as we had giant thought leaders like Albert Einstein and Davison and Germer exposing and formulating the fascinating characteristic about light that it is both wave and particle at the same time. And that distinction is really important because a wave can be spread out in space and time as a probability distribution, as something that can be, but exactly where it is cannot be known. You, can't, you cannot pick a piece of the light out of the lightness in your room. It's only when it emits a radiation that it can be localized. So that says an enormous amount about the divinity of consciousness. It says an enormous amount about the nature of the collective consciousness, the wave of what we are. And at the moment of action, at the moment of, of conscious choice, now the whole probability distribution collapses to one particular point. Now light goes from wave to particle. Now light isn't a potential, now it's a thing. So now it's distinct from another thing, from another particle of light. So now we have duality, we now have separation inherent in the character of light. And the nature of light reveals itself like a heartbeat. It goes from wave to particle and wave again. Like all of fa the whole fabric of the universe is like the very heartbeat rhythm of probability to reality to probability to reality constantly little quarks little quantum quarks fizzing and popping in and out of reality at the speed of light that's what all of this is made of and not only that but all time and motion cease at the point where any form of or of matter or energy approaches the speed of light so when we get to the speed of light, all time and motion cease, which means there is no process. There is no duality and there is no process. There is only is. And in that condition, there are no limits. In that condition, all resistance is eliminated. All probability is suspended in a superposition state and anything can happen. And because light, the photon fabric of what you are, because light is both wave and particle at the same time, right? you get the implications that therefore you are also potential and actual at the same time. It means that you are always in the potential for miraculous transformations of time, space and matter. You are always in the presence of the possibility of complete renewal. But you're making decisions at the speed of light. And light is collapsing from wave, wave to particle at the speed of light, just like that. And you are perceiving your creation and engaging with your creation and saying whatever you're saying about it and having that lived experience. And it's all made of light. In the words of Jesus, I am the way and the truth and the light. I am. And just as God said, let there be light, and there was light, so too are your creative declarations instantaneous, at least in potential. At least as soon as you say, as soon as you make a creative declaration, the potential for it has formed. But as created beings, we are locked in process. Morning and evening, not just on the first day, but in all our days. Our life is process, our life is unfolding. And so our declarations may be instantaneous, but it does still require that we see them and make agreement with them. So if you say, I am now healed from this ailment, it's your responsibility to see that healing being made manifest and saying, this is good. God didn't just create the light. 
he allowed the light, he said, let there be light, he allowed the light to be, and then he saw the light and knew that it was good. That is the engagement that makes your experience real. That's the engagement that takes your wish, your creative vision casting, out of spiritual fantasy world and into the very real lived experience of being you. So God created this extraordinary fabric of reality where all things are both manifest and potential at the same time. So nothing is created that cannot be recreated. And what does he do with it? Let's look. May, he goes on a party. He forms elements. He forms earth, wind and sky and ether. And then he brings those elements together and creates life abundantly. Extraordinary diversity. He creates trees of every kind bearing fruit with seed in it. An abundance that has its own innate ability to recreate itself. And then he created inquisitive consciousness. He created a great light to rule the day and a lesser light to rule the night. So now we have sovereignty and dominion because now we have the word rule. We have the word light, awareness, consciousness to rule the day and the night. We have sovereignty and dominion both in what is created and what is potential. Because so far we know about the darkness is that is, it is what's unformed. It's an unformed void. And if we now have the light to explore what is manifest and created, we also have the light to explore what is unformed. Notice that it was a lesser light to rule the night. So your shadow work is important, but it does not have nearly as much authority and impact as your light work does. He went on, he didn't stop there. Hang on, there's more. He carried on. He then took, he, he combined that life with sentience, right? So he, we, now we've got the elements and then he took the elements and he, he created life. So elements are now condensing into, ma into manifestation, into life. And then he's taking that inquisitive consciousness. He's taking sentience now. So now we have animals. Now we don't just have lots and lots of plants and lots of trees with fruit that bear seeds. Now we have animals, entities, creatures that know themselves in ascending capacity. What does that mean? What does knowing yourself in an ascending capacity mean? It means that there are levels of sentience that an elephant knows itself much more than a frog knows itself. And now, so we have now, we have life has moved into sentience. And then his piece de resistance, he takes those elements, combines them into life, combines that life into sentience, and then combines that into divinity. He said, let us make humankind in our image and let them have sovereign dominion over all life. So he's taken the elements, He's created life. He's had sentience born from that life and then divinity on top of that, into that, throughout that. And you are all those things. You are all those things. You're not just stardust. That's just the beginning. Notice that in Genesis 1.26, he says, let us create humankind in our image. That's curious, isn't it? Because so far we've only seen God as one, but clearly he's already knowing himself as relational. There's not just I am, there's also an us. Ooh, shivers. And then in, in, in Genesis 1.27, God created humankind in his image. So he said to his relational self, let us create humankind in our image. Let us take elements 
and combine them into life and combine them into sentience and combine them into divinity in our image. And it says, and in the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So we learn now that God is male and female. We learn that in his image, we are male and female. And God blessed humankind and gave us dominion over everything he had created. And he saw everything he had made and he said, it is good. So the alpha and omega beyond definition is now manifesting both masculine and feminine qualities. So these manifestations then are therefore part of an eternally balancing nature of existence. And even though male and female, they are part of one, they are clearly distinct. He has made it so that they are distinct. And perhaps that's the relationality that we see when in Genesis 1.26, he says, let us make humankind in our image. Maybe he is already knowing these distinctions Maybe knowing these distinctions is inherent in consciousness. So the most basic masculine manifestation, therefore, is that of source. So we have seed, we have the will, we have the penetrating extension of potential. We have the ejaculating expression of reality. We have the saying, let there be light and there is light. And so the characteristics of this node of creation, this masculine aspect of the one, the characteristics here are that they are firm, steadfast, constant, dependable. So let's look at the most basic feminine manifestation. Here we have that of loving consciousness. In Genesis 1-2, the spirit is moving upon the waters, this dynamic power of creation through incubation, through manifestation, through nurturing. And so we have the characteristics of this node of creation as interactional, adaptive and malleable. And so God has now created the elemental, living, sentient, divine creatures in his image as manifestations of both masculine nodes of creation and feminine nodes of creation. So God is both and, which means we are both and. Oh my gosh, that's good. So look at the, look at the implications here again. So in each individual strand of God, just like you. So we are saying here that from the dark formless void was created in the likeness of its image, you, a very unique and individual one who is knowing yourself in some capacity and you are a combination of male and female aspects, there are female and female aspects to what you are and how you work. And that indwelling potential can be either in balance or out of balance. But a true marriage, a true marriage of love, a true marriage of Christ and his body requires a balance of feminine and masculine energy. And of course, if we look at this through the sovereign lens, then this has got nothing to do with gonads and chromosomes because those are manifest, for, those are particularized things. Those are actualized things. And what we're talking about is something that far precedes things. So it's got nothing to do with how your body is shaped. And it's got everything to do with the relationship between what is firm and steadfast and what is malleable and changing. Light and light. And then, yeah, so, so 127. And then God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. 
So God is male and female, and he blessed us. He blessed us as made in his image and gave us dominion over all of what he had created. So now we have sovereign conscious choice over light and light. So now we are able to create as God in a balance of masculine and feminine energies between structure and essence, potentiality and what is made manifest. And he saw everything he had made and he said that it was good. So Adam was created first, the first manifestation of God as a sentient being. We look at what God is again here, Trinity of source, of spirit and of substance. And substance is uh, at, at the most basic fundamental level, substance is form, particularized reality. God made manifest. And it's built up of adamantine particles, the God particle. And adamant is a word that means firm. And Adam was the first manifestation of God. And the first time God was made manifest as a sentient being. And then Eve, which is Hebrew for life, Eve was born from that structure, from the rib of the human. So, so do we see then that if human consciousness has the, has the dominion over the malleability of life, which is formed from the human consciousness as a structure, is that true? Let's look at the sovereign model of human consciousness. So Adam, that which is adamant, that first thing which is particularized as a sentient knowing of itself, that structure is what begets life. That, that framework, the rib of the human is what forms life, Eve, the malleability of experience, the mother of life. And that makes sense, seems to make sense to me. And this led to the fall, the great fall of humankind. This is one of my favorite stories in Genesis. And we're gonna spend a lot more time on it next week when we examine the second mastery in the sovereign way, which is recognizing. And we're really gonna immerse ourselves into the craft of discerning God's voice from the serpent's voice. But for today, for today, let's look at the fall and just say that since our consciousness has dominion over life and our creative declarations are instantaneous speed of light and light potential collapses into particle at the moment of action and our experience of life is a causal response to our consciousness, then what a disaster that we chose to embody the knowing of good and evil. Oh, wow, what a moob choice. <laughs> Mate, because look, let's look at that again. Since our consciousness has dominion over life and the creative declarations that we make are instantaneous. We are the suffering ones. I am the one who has arthritis of every joint in my body. Uh, that's not possible. That's not how it works, etc. Since our creative declarations are instantaneous and since, since light the, the bio photon fabric of what life reality is made of since light collapses shoop, into particle at the moment of action. And says your life, your experience of life is a causal response, which means it comes from your consciousness. Then what a disaster when you choose to embody the knowing of good and evil. Now I am knowing what is good and what is not good. And this is the first time in the Bible that we come across not good as a potential. Because so far, 
everything that God has done, he has said, this is good. So if we want to work like God, if we want to be like God, if we want to be creators like him, then our responsibility in, in engaging with our creation is to know that it is good. But, but alas, that's not what we do. There we are in an infinite field of abundance and possibility of self-perpetuating abundance, by the way, the, the tree with the fruit with the seed in it. So we're in this field of self-perpetuating abundance and infinite possibility. And we're allowed to eat from the tree of life anytime we like. So in other words, we have instantaneous, immediate access to a wellspring of life force. And we're given the assignment to till and keep the garden, it says right here. God says, okay, I've created you now, I've put you in the garden, and your job is to till and keep the garden. In other words, to nourish what is good. And God says, but don't eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and of evil, God says in Genesis 2.17, because on that day, you shall die. That's the end. That's the end of this paradise. If you eat, if you choose to embody, and remember our definition of embody, it is when, when it is so established in your framework of consciousness that you're no longer choosing, that it's just how you know yourself. If you choose to embody the knowing of good and of evil, well, now look what happens. You're no longer seeing that it is good. Now you are seeing that it is good and evil. So now you're creating from judgments of what you're, you're, you're creating from and experiencing and engaging with life from your judgments of what counts as good and what counts as evil. So now what was pure potential what was pure good potential has now collapsed from its super state position into something that you call evil. What, what is it that you call evil? Search your life if you like and count all the ways that you know that it is evil, which is not how God was working. Suddenly, suddenly now that I, now that I am creating evil, from my choice to know good and evil, suddenly my innocence is exposed. Suddenly now I'm at risk. Suddenly now there's room for shame. In Genesis 3.14, God explains the energetic consequences of being a dualistic framework of consciousness. Instead of being 100% free to be, now, you're not free to be anymore. Now you're making judgments about the correctness of life. What are, the, what are the consequences? God tells us what the consequences are in Genesis 3, 14. Separation is immediate. That immediately happens. Separation is immediate. Now you're expelled from the garden of possibility and you're wandering about in the deserts, toiling to make life work for you. Not only that, but creation is much more, much more painful. He says, I will greatly increase the pangs of childbirth because you can no longer create by innocent delight and curiosity because now you're wrapped up in outlining the correct creative process based on what is good and evil as far as you're concerned. You can't help it because you're, you're busy knowing, you're knowing good and evil. You have now embodied the knowledge of good and of evil, which means that there is separation and duality in your life, which means there is a correct way and an incorrect way. There is a way for things to form and a way for things not to form because that would be bad, because there is badness going on. So you've now participated, you've chosen conscious participation with duality, and we are living the energetic consequences of that. That's the story of the fall. That's the, that's the explanation 
of why life is the way it is. You say, what's the meaning of life? That's kind of the meaning of life right here. Is that through free will, we chose to have a sort of creative consciousness, a creative framework where we get to know both good and evil. And the consequence of that is that we are no longer in a constant state of self-perpetuating abundance and possibility. We are now in a dualistic process-based system of cause and effect based on some things that are good and some things that are bad. And you know, even with the greatest intentions, we want to save the world and we want to rid it of evil. And in doing so, we create what we speak and we see it and we know that it is evil. Do you see the implication when it comes to light? But look at this, in, in Genesis 3.20, in Genesis 3.21, sorry, Genesis 3.21, just before we're expelled from the Garden of Eden, God and the Lord God made garments of skins for the man and for his wife, and he clothed them. That is mercy. So even though we've chosen a, a framework of creative consciousness where we find ourselves wandering in the desert trying to come home, God has clothed us. He loves us so much. We are so beloved and so cherished and so known by him that he has equipped us 100% to make our way back home to protect us from the elements. And therefore all hardship is temporary and fleeting if we have the mastery of remembering. The mastery of remembering. Actually, even though I'm here declaring certain things as good and as evil, in ultimate truth, in ultimate potentiality, light is all there is. The rest of Genesis is incredible. It's absolutely incredible. So we have the story of lineage and I'm gonna rush through it. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna dwell for very long on, on the rest of Genesis, but I want you to read the whole Genesis because it is an incredible story. But what happens next, um, after, uh, after uh, Adam and Eve are expelled from potentiality, from the experience of self-perpetuating abundance, and they're now roaming in life. So now we're having the human experience of needing to toil for our goodness, of being slaves to system, slaves to linearity, cause and effect. You've got to sow on this day and reap on that day. And then we have 10 generations of an ancient, fairly advanced civilization of giants who lived incredibly long, who had, who had real longevity of life. And we have 10 generations of advanced civilization. And we don't know much about them other than that it wasn't going very well. We don't know much, but we do know that like us, those previous civilizations had the knowing of good and of evil. And we can probably deduce that more often than not, they were choosing evil or creating from that place. All we know is that it, those 10 generations led to a great flood that wiped out all ancient civilizations. So this is a likely the same flood that is recreated, reformulated across all spiritual columns of thought. All ancient teachings speak of the great flood that eliminated the early civilizations. And according to, according to archeology, span the sediments show that the flood was likely about 7,500 years ago. So we have some remnants from the civilizations that preceded that. We have the Sphinx in Egypt is probably about 10,000 years old. And we have some other monuments from the generations before the great flood. But we know very, very little because, because it was a flood. It was a deluge. It was all wiped clean and start again. 
So following that flood then, we have, we have Noah, and then we have a story of covenant. We have a story of lineage and the passing of faith and culture and paradigm from one generation to another generation across the ages. The word covenant means agreement, promise, making an agreement with God about how life is going to be, what expectations you place on creative possibility, and how you show up for what manifests. So the rest of, of Genesis after the flood is about the, the, the early formations of this covenant, this paradigm that goes on to know itself as Israel. And Israel is defined by its characteristic of being on the one hand a deceiver, just like Eve, just like life itself, being the deceiver, that which doubts, that which knows evil as well as good, and, and overcoming that. You see, Israel was Jacob who was born the deceiver and who wrestled with God in an epic dream and overcame his, his doubt, his deceit, his, his way of being and became restored and renewed. Israel means he who wrestles with God overcomes. He who, he who engages with God, he engages with his doubt, brings his doubt to the table and wrestles with God, will overcome. And so the rest of Genesis is that story about how this lineage is passed down, this way of being, this way of knowing ourselves. Are you or are you not influenced by your lineage? Are you or are you not influenced by the cultural paradigms and creative decisions of those who came before you and before you and before you. And that's not a bad thing. Got to, we've got to not be so angry all the time at having, having had paradigms passed down for us because that's what lineage is. You know, and knowing your lineage is an act of deep honor for where you've come from and how your diamond has been shaped by decision and engagement over time. Right, decision to know light and to know light as good. Decision, uh, yes, decision and engagement over time. Your consciousness has been shaped by those who came before you. And if you know your lineage, then you also understand the momentum that's been set for your life, right? So where you know where the flow is because water flows where the riverbed has already been carved. So if you've come from a particular lineage, then the chances are that even on a subtle level, you have creative declarations in place in your subconscious, in your cellular consciousness, that mean that creative flow is likely to go in that way. Great, you know that, you know where the path of least resistance is. But it's also a liberation from that identity. Because if you know your lineage, then you also know which influences you're creatively vulnerable to. And then that means you're free to choose at the speed of light to be free from that, to break the riverbanks and set a new course. And you can do that when you're aware that a choice can be made. So that's the importance of lineage. If you, if you know that this is showing up constantly in your life, and it also showed up constantly for your mother and your grandmother and your great-grandmother, you can understand that you are participating in a lineage. And either you choose to engage with that and be a part of the alchemy, or you set a new course. It's all good, but you have to be aware that a choice can be made. You have to remember. So that means that we are the ones who get heart disease and arthritis because aging sucks and that's just life. That becomes, I am healed and healing. Or we are the ones who must avoid pain and death at all costs becomes, I'm free to live. Or we are the ones who work hard and never quit becomes, I am free to work and play in devotion. Or how about, we are the ones who must suffer for progress 
and we are persecuted and despised for being the vanguards of consciousness. <laughs> that becomes, I am free to become and to love in my unique way. How about I am safe to become and to love in my unique way? Would you like to make that agreement and put that in your consciousness? How about we can't do that? That's not possible. That's not how it works. Nobody's going to forgive your debts or magically repair your cellular system. You're not going to get that car. It doesn't work like that. That becomes, let's see how it happens. Let's just see. Let there be light. Or what about this one? What about this one? What about we are the ones who are working towards a better world? What if that could become that world is here now? I see the light and I know that it is good. I know that it is good. So remembering this truth is one part of the mastery and remembering that I need remembering, that's another part of the mastery. You gotta, you gotta remember that you need remembering. Because as, as, the, as the Old Testament shows us, life as a human is complex, it's comprehensive. Hardship is a part of the game for a framework of consciousness that chooses to know good and evil. And if you're, whether, you're man, whether you're suffering manifests in your life circumstances, let's say like your relationships or your finances, or perhaps your suffering manifests in your behavior, perhaps you keep making poor choices or poor reactions, or perhaps your suffering manifests in your body, disease or sickness or, or weight you can't lose. Maybe it manifests in your vibration, like bipolar emotions or energetic disturbances like demons and entities and mercury retrograde. Or maybe it shows up in your, in your mental health. Maybe it shows up as anxiety or depression or schizophrenia or, or narcissism or victimhood. Hardship is us wandering in the desert of consciousness, trying to find our way home. It's a part of life. And when I remember the truth of what I am and what you are and what makes life, well, then I am free then I am free. It says in John 14, 20, at that day, at that day, you will know that I am in my father and you in me and I in you. You can't do anything else on this planet as an enlightened master if you haven't mastered the art of remembering that that's what you are. The moment you submit your sovereign dominion of light, your sovereign dominion of light's ability to collapse into the particle of your choice, the moment you submit that dominion, you're not remembering. The system is choosing for you. The economics is choosing for you. The politicians are choosing, your, your ancient childhood traumas are choosing, something else is choosing, but you're not. You're not remembering. True remembering is both a recollection, like, oh, yes, that's true, I remember. But it's also remembering yourself into your knowing, into, into your knowing of the flow of divinity, remembering yourself into that wellspring of life force, like, like placing a member back onto, uh, onto the body, becoming one with the body again, being a part of all that is endless knowing yourself as the omnipresence of vital light that restores all things to divine perfection. The omnipresence of vital light that is both potential and manifest at the same time. And so that hollow groan of loneliness that we feel in the darkest of times, in that hollow groan, now, right now in your mind, go back to that darkness, go back to that depth, to that hollow void, that unformed void of darkness, go there and remember the ache and know that even in the shadows of the dark formless void, the spirit is moving upon the waters. 
and you are aware of the light. You are aware of the spark of light that never goes away. I promise you it cannot because it's what you're made of. Behold your light and know that it is good. Thank you very much for watching today. I'm gonna to close off the live stream and we will open the table for our group in the Oasis.